Well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me this morning to Exodus chapter 11. If you knew this morning, we're in a series that we've titled Led by Fire. And we're watching as God calls Moses to deliver the nation of Israel from bondage in Egypt and how God empowers him. And we're gonna see today as, as the Lord begins to lead him and the nation literally by fire. And I believe it's a, a very relevant topic and series for us because they were going through a crisis, God met them, God led them by fire, and they saw miracles that were unlike anything they'd ever seen before in their life. And I know this, as we walk through this pandemic and these very unusual times, that the same God who led them wants to lead you. The same God who worked miracles for them wants to work miracles for you, for all of us. He wants to lead us by fire. This morning, as we come to Exodus chapter 11 and 12 and 13, we are coming to what is arguably outside of the creation of the world and the creation of mankind. This is the most significant event in all of the Old Testament. It's more important than Noah and the ark. It's more important than David and Goliath. It's more important than Daniel and the lion's den. There is no story, no event in the Old Testament more important than what we're going to read today in Exodus chapter 11, the Exodus. The reason why it's so important is because it is not only a, an account of how God delivered the nation of Israel from slavery in Egypt and set them free. But it is what theologians call a typology. That's a theological term to explain that in the Old Testament, we have for us pictures that demonstrate through different stories what Christ will be, what Jesus Christ will do for us. This is one of the most powerful Old Testament typologies that there is in all of Scripture. This explains to us the work of Jesus Christ in a fundamental way. And so today, this, this involves some theology, it involves some deep thinking, but it's critically important that we understand this. Because if you and I don't understand the work of Christ, then we don't understand the gospel. And we cannot communicate with urgency. Indeed, we will not communicate with urgency the, the message of good news that, that Jesus Christ came to save us from judgment. He came to save us from the penalty of sin, which is death. If we don't understand that, we don't understand the gospel. We don't understand the nature of sin. We don't understand the assurance that we have and the great love that God has for us. So as we come to Exodus chapter 11 and verse, or from verse one on through chapter 13, this is an illustration, I would say at its heart, of what Jesus did for us. It would help to maybe just think of it this way, because when you say typology, people, it's a type of Christ, a type of what he did. But the Old Testament was designed to prepare us in our understanding for what Jesus would do for humanity, what he would do for us. In some ways, it's like a primer. It's like a, an early education book. Uh, maybe you've got children that are learning to read. I know we've got two of our, grand, of our eight grandchildren right now are learning to read. And, and if you've watched how a child learns to read, often it involves there'll be a page and there'll be the letter C and then there'll be a picture of a, of a cat and there'll be the sound of C and, and putting it all together teaches as it spells out the word, teaches a child how to read. So it's the pictures along with the letters that creates understanding. 
When you come to Exodus chapters 11 through 13, there are pictures that create understanding theologically for us. I realize as I do this that unfortunately in many pulpits, and I'm not trying to, to sell this pulpit, I'm just trying to tell you why I would do it. There are many pulpits today that have simply left theology behind except at its most basic point, which is basically God loves you and he cares for you, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's important for us if we're going to grow in Christ and grow deep in Christ that we understand some deeper theological truth. So as we look at this, I want to give you three pictures, if you will. The first is the plagues. It's a picture of judgment. The second is the Passover, it's a picture of Jesus. And the third is the pillar of fire, and that's a picture of our own journey. So let's look at it. First of all, the plagues, a picture of judgment. Let's begin reading in Exodus chapter 11. Now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Remember, we've seen nine plagues all of them increasingly severe in their devastation until finally the land of Egypt is ruined and still Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, would not let the people of Israel go. The Lord said after that, after this last plague, this next plague, he will let you go from here and when he does, he will drive you out completely. In verse 4, we read this. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says about midnight. I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the slave girl who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. I mean, imagine this. It's easy to read this and just move on, but think for a moment. If in the greater Springfield area, in one night, the firstborn of every family, every home, of all of the livestock died, Can you imagine the sorrow? Can you imagine the devastation? Can you imagine the grief and the confusion? But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any man or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before me and saying, go, you and all the people who follow after you, And after that, I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. You say, why did God decide to take the firstborn? Well, back in chapter 4 of Exodus, the Lord said, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go, so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. In that sense, all nine plagues prior to this one were warnings of God's greater judgment. Why? Because God is a God who warns people. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, Ezekiel chapter 18. He would rather that people would turn. He would rather that people repent. Here's what's interesting to note. Even as he is telling the Egyptians that judgment will fall on them, it's important for you and I to note that judgment would also fall on Israel. They too faced the the prospect that they would lose their firstborn. In fact, look at it in chapter 12 and verse 21. Moses summoned the elders of Israel, said to them, go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, that would be uh, a plant uh, that would be similar to a a weed with with a lot of leaves on, on the stem. Dip it into the blood of the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. 
When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and to strike you. If Israel does not slaughter the lamb, if they do not put the blood on the doorpost signifying that they are covered by the blood, that they are under the blood, their firstborn will also die. Judgment would enter their home. In order to escape judgment, there had to be the shedding of blood. This is a picture of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It's important for people to hear that. Being a good person is not enough. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How are you going to deal with your sin? It has to be dealt with if you're going to have eternal life. Attending church, being a good person, giving money, being better than other people you know, None of those things will cover your sin. None of those things will remove your sin. None of those things will get you forgiveness from your sin. There has to be the shedding of blood. Right. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it is appointed for men to die once and after that the judgment. It's important everybody understands in this room, everybody watching online, everybody at every one of the campuses that there is coming a day when you and I will face judgment unless we've accepted the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is very, very clear that there's a record being kept of everything that men say, everything that men do. It's being written down. Jesus alluded to this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, I tell you the truth, men will give an account for every idle word they've spoken. Unless you receive the forgiveness that comes only through faith in him, there will come a day when you will give an account and you will be judged. That is why blood has to be shed. Their sin had to be covered or they would face judgment. And in the same way, our sin has to be covered or we face judgment. And once our sin is covered, what it does is it opens the door for you and I to experience the goodness of God, the graciousness of God, the miraculous working of God as we're gonna see in their life. That same thing is available to us. It opens the door for you and I to be led by fire. So it is a picture of judgment. Let me show you a second picture, the Passover lamb. And this is a picture of Jesus. This event shows us then what Jesus would do in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3. Tell the whole community of Israel on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Take care of them, that's the lambs, until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Now I want you to think about this for just a moment. If if you've had children, or you were a child, so that pretty much covers everybody. (laughs) If you have a pet in your home, even if that pet's only there for four days, what's gonna happen? You're gonna get attached. They would bring that lamb, and that lamb, they didn't, I mean, their homes would have been very simple. That lamb would have been there. It would have, for the next four days, been the object of their attention, the recipient of their affection. The children would become attached to it. The children would be asking, why does the lamb have to die? The parents would be explaining, and maybe even the parents themselves finding themselves attached. And that sacrifice would introduce a sorrow with it, a sadness with it, an understanding that that there is a loss of life to cover sin. 
In Exodus chapter 12, we read in verse 5, the animals you choose must be year olds without defect. In verse 7 of Exodus chapter 12, then they are to take some of the blood, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the house where they eat the lamb. So it'd be right there at the entrance that this house has been covered by the blood. In verse 12, we read this, on that same night, I will pass through, this is the Lord, I'll pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. This is why that Jewish feast that commemorates this is called the Passover. When God would see the blood on the doorpost, he would pass over. Judgment would pass over. And when you and I apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our life, judgment passes over us. Furthermore, no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Money wouldn't keep them from facing judgment. I mean, people want to, a lot of times people are like, you know, I just don't understand. Listen, it doesn't matter what the Israelites understood or didn't understood, understand. If they didn't do this, they would face judgment. Yeah. See, a lot of times people get hung up unless it makes sense to them, unless they understand it, unless they see value to it, they don't think it's necessary for them to do. Right. At some point, we have to say, the Bible is God's word given to us to instruct us regarding God's thoughts, and there is only one God, and that is the true God revealed to us in three persons in the Bible. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. The Bible is exclusive. There's not a thousand roads to heaven. There is only one way. And we only get there through the forgiveness of our sins as we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only by the blood of a spotless lamb could they escape judgment. And that's a picture of what Jesus did for us. He, he was without sin. The Bible says he was without sin and he became made sin for us as our sins were placed on him. From the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 1, John the Baptist sees Jesus, and he's in the river, Jesus, or John is, and he's baptizing, and disciples are there with him, and he sees Jesus walking along the riverbank. Here's what he says. He saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You can't take away your sin. I can't take away my sin. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. John chapter 1 and verse 35, the following day, it's, it's day 2. John was again standing with two of his disciples, and as Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there's the Lamb of God. Paul draws, draws this analogy even closer as you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. For Christ, our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed. For us. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. Listen, no amount of money can buy your salvation. No amount of good works can buy your salvation. No amount of being a nice person can buy your salvation. You weren't redeemed with money. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, just like the Passover lamb, it had to be spotless. It had to be without defect because it was a picture of Christ. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that through him we might become the righteousness of God. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And I don't want to get too technical, but as Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which the Bible doesn't call it a Sunday, and really if you follow the chronology, it's a Monday, but we celebrate it on a Sunday, so it becomes Palm Sunday, but it's really a Monday, four days before the Passover, Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on the 10th day of the month. 
presenting himself as the Passover lamb for the nation. And on the day that he is crucified, he is examined and he is judged. And Pontius Pilate five times says, I find no fault in him. He is the spotless lamb. He is the perfect lamb. And at the time of the evening sacrifice, three o'clock in the afternoon, he hangs on the cross. And he cries out, it is finished! Surrenders his spirit and dies that if you and I put our faith in him, we might be saved. It's his shed blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. He's our Passover lamb. He's the one who died in our place. First John chapter 1 and verse 7 says, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It, it, theologians call this, it expiates. It, 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 does, it removes it. It's gone. You can't find it. You can't see it. The, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins and transgressions from us. And if you don't understand that, then you'll constantly be coming back to, to past sin and, and, and agonizing in a way God never intended. Remembering what he has cleansed and removed and forgotten. He is the Lamb of God. I just, this is so important for you and I to grasp. Listen, in heaven, what he did on earth will be remembered for all eternity. It will be the reason why we get to go to heaven and we will marvel and we get, a, we get a, a glimpse of heaven in Revelation chapter five as around the throne room we read this, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep, see the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed, he's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So Jesus is known as the lion. He's also known as the lamb. He's a conqueror and a king. He's also a savior and a servant. I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. And he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That's God the Father. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures, these are angelic beings, and the 24 elders, other angelic beings, fell down before the Lamb. That's Jesus. And each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Every time you're praying, every time we're worshiping, it's adding to that incense, and it's remembered before God. And they sang a new song, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you've made them to be a kingdom of priests and to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 and they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice, they say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. This is why what we read in Exodus is so important. It gets us ready for what we're going to experience when we enter the throne room of heaven. It's why when times we sing songs and it talks about a Lamb, we're talking about the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. 
He is the lamb. I've heard of some places where pastors say, you know, don't sing about the lamb. People won't understand it. Listen, I'm not afraid to sing theology. Because if people don't understand it, just stick around. You'll come to figure it out. But to forsake pictures like this that are so critical to our spiritual formation and foundation, to forsake them just because we're afraid people won't understand it is a massive loss. Exodus, back to Exodus chapter 12, and at midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all of his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. Imagine that. That's the thoroughness of God's judgment. Let me just, let me just say that. Everybody, I mean, you get to the book of Revelation at the end, it talks about this Judgment, Revelation chapter 20, and John says, I saw a great white throne, and he who was seated on it, who is that? That's Jesus Christ. And earth and sky fled from his presence. What does that mean? It's the uncreation of the universe in an instant. And I saw the dead, both great and small, rich and poor, standing before the throne. These are the people who did not receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the books were opened, the Bible says, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as was written in the books. No one winds up in hell by accident. No one says, well, I don't know how I got, no, 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 no. You did this, you did this, you did this, you said this, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. And then it says, and I saw another book, the book of life was opened. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, they were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Heaven keeps very good records. When a person gives their heart to Jesus, your name is written down as your record of sin is erased. Not just past sin, but present sin, future sin, forgiven. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you and the Israelites, go worship the Lord as you've requested. Take your flocks and herds as you've said and go. And also, bless me. And the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country. For otherwise, they said, we'll all die. So there's a picture of judgment. That's the 10th plague. There's the Passover lamb, which is a picture of Jesus. And third, there's a pillar of fire, which is a picture of our journey. It's the middle of the night. The people are leaving Egypt. You can imagine it's dark, and now you've got a very large company of people, as we're going to see, leaving. And having come under the blood of the lamb, they are now being redeemed. They've been redeemed, they've been saved, they've been bought with a price. Such a beautiful picture. And now God goes before them, and he goes before them in a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. You see, once you and I get saved, God begins to go before us. God begins to lead us. God begins to guide us, as we're going to see. Exodus 13, verse 21. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or by night. This is going to be absolutely essential for them as they flee Egypt because, as we're going to see next week, Pharaoh's going to chase them down with his army. 
They're going to need to travel at night because they can't travel during the heat of the day. It's a desert. But there is so much light off this pillar of fire at night that they're able to travel by day or by night. So they're traveling part of the night, part of the day. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Now, just quickly, I, I want to mention just three benefits that are a part of this cloud or this pillar of fire, the cloud indicative of God's presence, the pillar of fire as well, his presence. He is a burning fire. First of all, guidance, that's a benefit. As they're fleeing, they're, they're traveling and God is going before them. He's leading them. He's guiding them. At night, in the darkest night, he's guiding them. When, when you are going through a dark time in your life, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, you can be sure of this. He's going before you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will guide you in the day with his presence and at night with his light. He will be there. Nehemiah chapter 9, recounting this, says, By day you led them with a pillar of cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the way they were to take. When you are led by fire, a part of being led by fire is there is a guidance, there is a direction as the Lord shows you, as he directs your steps. I love Psalm 37, where it says in verse 23, the steps of a righteous person. Who is a righteous person? The only righteous person is the one who has a righteousness of Jesus because they've been washed by the blood. The steps of a righteous person are directed by the Lord, and he delights in every detail of their lives, every detail of their lives. God directing you, leading you, guiding you, delighting in the, in the big decisions, the little decisions, God guiding you. That's what it means to be led by fire, the Lord going before you, not just in the big things. He cares about the little things. He cares about everything. It's the second blessing or benefit, and that's provision. Look at it in chapter 12 and verse 37. The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, and there were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So scholars estimate there are about 2 million people. This is a massive group of people. It would require about four million pounds of food each day to feed them. That's three freight trains a mile long. They would need 11 million gallons of water a day. That would be a freight train with 334 tanker cars. You say, that's impossible. Not for our God. Our God, when you're led by fire, he does impossible things. He provides in ways you can't begin to imagine. That's what I loved about the Frazier's testimony. They were talking about how God provided. He's a God who does that. When you're led by fire, he's going to provide for your needs. Paul said, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Third benefit, protection. In Exodus chapter 14, we'll just kind of take a sneak peek at what we're going to look, look at next time. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them, and they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. And in verse 19, we read this, Then the angel of God, who is the angel of the Lord? It's Jesus. Jesus said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. He was showing that as he was leading the nation of Israel out of Egypt, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. And throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so that neither went near the other all night long. Would you notice that? There's a burning pillar of fire. It brings light to one side. It brings darkness to the other. The same God who brings joy and peace to us, to those who don't know him, can bring absolute devastation. 
Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we wanna connect with all our online family. You can just click the link next to me to connect to us. We'd love to meet you and connect with you. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to the channel and press the bell for notifications. I'll tell you what, it's a great thing to do because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and that helps you stay up to date with everything that's happening. We hope you have a great day to day and we'd love for you to join us live for our services every Sunday and Wednesday. Thank you again for watching and God bless.